Go ahead and take your seats. It will be just a minute or two before the hearing. Thank you.
Detective Douglas, good morning. Good morning, sir. If you'll please stand. Yes, sir. And if you'll please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of law? Yes, sir. Go ahead and take your seat and make yourself comfortable. Come up to the microphone as much as possible. Why don't you begin this morning by giving us, giving the jury your full and complete name, the sure. spelling of your last name, and with whom sure. you are currently affiliated? My name is uh, Severo F. Torres. I'm a detective with the Las Cruces Police Department. My last name spelling is T-O-R-R-E-S. Thank you. Mr. Rourke, you can commence with your direct examination of Detective Douglas. Thank you, Your Honor. And just to indicate to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, because those of us who don't speak fluent Spanish, yes. you go by a different first name. Right, I go by Frank, my middle name. Okay. Now, Detective Torres, for what length of time have you been a Las Cruces Police Department officer. I graduated from the Academy in February of 2002. Now, you're currently a detective, is that correct? Yes, sir. And for what length of time have you been a detective? Uh, since the middle of 2009 when I was moved over to uh, criminal investigations. Okay. And you've remained a detective since that time? Yes, sir. Now, you were called in to assist in the investigation involving the death of Jeremy Martin, is that correct? That is correct. And I know you interviewed a lot of witnesses, is that correct? That's true. Now, did you also have occasion to go to the Hotel Encanto on October the 29th of 2014 for follow-up investigation? Yes, I did. While there, did you meet with an individual by the name of Stacy Nash? Yes, I did. Do you know what position she held with the hotel in Conto? She's the uh, director, uh, she's a risk management director for the hotel. Okay. And at that time, did you receive certain documents from her regarding the reservation and what's called the key card information from her? Yes, I did. And did you take that into uh, your custody? Yes, I did. And did you have a conversation with her about what these items represent? Yes, I did. Your Honor, by stipulation, the state at this time would introduce as state's exhibit number 298. It shows, and I'll describe when the court's ready. All right, let me see. Are we at that number? I'll show us. Yes, uh, the last one was 297. So state's exhibit 298. Yes, Your Honor. The description is a three-page exhibit. It's encaptioned Jeremy Martin's reservation information and a user activity log. Again, Mr. Day, it is without objection. That's right, Your Honor. No objection. All right. The court is going to admit into evidence state's exhibit number 298. Go ahead and proceed with your examination. Okay, Your Honor, there is a second exhibit in which has been marked as State's Exhibit 299. And just a general description of that item. Yes, Your Honor. It's what's called the key card information, and it's used to access rooms at the hotel in Conto. Okay, Mr. Day, is this without objection? There are no objections to 299. And again, just to make sure that you have no others or just these two. Just these two. All right. So the court is going to admit into evidence state's exhibit 299. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead, and did Stacey, Stacey Nash explain to you the information? Well, first off, did you make a request for certain information from her? Yes, I did. What did you request, please? Uh, basically, I wanted information on the booking of the room, who booked the room, um, what day, for how many people, and the information regarding the keys, how many keys were issued and at what time uh, were they used to access the room. Okay. And we talk about, you talked about keys, and for those of us older, that means a right. metal object. Right. Is that what you're talking about? These keys are the electronic keys. They basically are the credit card style keys, the magnetic electronic keys. Okay. And did she indicate to you that the hotel uh, kept records of who accessed any given room at any given time? Yes, she indicated that they did that. Okay. 
Let me show you first State's Exhibit 299, page 1. And Crisis address and phone number um, down off uh, towards the bottom. It gives a credit card number uh, ending in 0035, which we later found out was Mr. Martin's credit card. It has an approval amount on there for incidentals of $27.50. Uh, and it gives an arrival date of 1027, a checkout date of October 28. And uh, there is a code on there that indicates it's from Expedia if the booking was made through an Expedia reservation. And okay. um, that, that's the basic information that's on there. Okay. Let me show you the second page of State's Exhibit number 298, entitled User Activity Log. And I'll have to zoom out a little bit on this one. Is this another document you've received? Yes, it is. Okay. And can you explain this document to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Right. It has a lot of the same information as the previous document. At the uh, very bottom, if you read it from the bottom up, it just uh, uh, basically um, shows that a room is confirmed. Uh, it gives you the dates of October 27, as well as a departure date. Um, it is a, a room type, which is an A2D, which is two double beds. Uh, it gives the rate. It uh, also tells you the payment method. Um, going up, it uh, advises the name. You see the name Jeremy Martin as a person associated with that. Um, going a little bit further up, you see that uh, there is an approval for the $27.50, which is for the incidentals. The approval is on a it looks like a Visa card for Jeremy Martin, and it's room number 711. And finally, I believe you received information that the room was booked through, I believe you said Expedia. Expedia, yes, sir. Was this another document that was provided to you? Yes. And Please describe what this is. What this is, is this is the actual fax that they received from Expedia, and this is to notify them that Expedia has received a booking uh, for a room, and it uh, gives, again, the same information with respect to the date, October 27, checkout date, October 28. Um, it uh, identifies the guest as being Jeremy Martin. It uh, gives Mr. Martin's phone number. Uh, the type of room, which is two double beds, um, it adv advises that there's going to be two adults in the room for one night, and obviously the price of the room. And it has on there the uh, payment method, which is uh, is something that Expedia does. It's their virtual card. It's how they they actually send uh, payment to the hotel. Thank you. Now, you also indicated you received a printout regarding the key card information, is that correct? Yes, sir. Let me show you now what's been marked as State Certificate 299, and we're focused solely upon um, the, uh, the dates of October 27th.
used uh, to access the room. How many cards were issued? Two cards were issued. How many cards were used to access the room? Only card number one was used. Okay. Is there any way to tell which person had what key card? We can surmise, we surmise that it was Mr. Martin based on uh, the entries into the room through investigation. Okay. Now, are the times, I mean, the date, is that correct? The, the date is correct, the times are off. Um, uh, you'll see some times there, such as 2220, 2230, 2226, 2236, 2242, and a time there on the 27th of 2321. Those times are off, actually. Why are they off? Uh, as was explained to me by Ms. Nash, is they probably failed to account for daylight saving time. So the, the, um, I had to bump up one hour to get a, a more accurate time, but it's actually more than an hour off. Okay. Now, let's take a look at item number three. On 1027, it says 2242. Yes. Could you explain what the actual time would be on entry into that room? 2242, so if you bump it up at least an hour, you're looking at yeah, 2342, which is 1142 p.m. And there's an entry there that says guest card. Right. What does that mean? It means that the uh, guest, the actual guest card that had been issued was used to access this room. Okay. And is that the last entry for guest card? Yes, it is. At that time, it is. Okay. And going to item number four, or listing number four, will you please indicate to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, once again, it's on October the 27th, what time, actual time, should that be? Yeah, item number four, again, you need to move it up by an hour. It's off at least an hour, so you need to look at it as 23, 36, or 11, 36 p.m. Okay. So, let's go to item number five, under guest card. What access would that actually be? Um, moving it up an hour, it would actually be 11.26 p.m. And then moving to item number six, what time would that actually be? Uh, that time would be 11.20 p.m. Okay. And before that, on the 27th, uh, what time would that be, line number seven? That would be 3.35 uh, in the afternoon. And would that have been shortly after the arrival? Yes. Now, just to explain what's at the top, lines number one and two, there's a sub-master card that's used to gain access to the room. Were you able to find out what a sub-master card is? Yeah, these are the master cards that are able to access all of the rooms. They can to, uh, go into any room. These are um, given to management or to people who are cleaning the rooms. Okay. And what time was item or line number two using the submaster uh, card? That would be um, at 12:21 a.m. of the 28th, October 28th. And having been involved in this investigation, do you know why the room was accessed on that date and time? Um, we accessed, or police officers accessed that room to gain entry. And then there's one other item, line number one, also submaster card. Yes. What, what time would that be, please? Uh, this would be at 12.25, um, uh, looks like in the, in, the, in the afternoon. And once again, do you know why the room was accessed through the master card at that time? or submaster card? On the 28th, uh, maybe to open the door for processing or to, after we release the scene. Okay. Thank you. Your witness. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Mr. David, cross-examination of the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. 
Good morning, Mr. Bidwick. We put on the Elmo device here, stage 299, which you were just talking about. Here. Line that up. So you'd agree with me that the last time that card was used was 11.42 p.m., is that right? At 11, by the guest, uh, like I said, it's off by more than an hour, so we're just indicating an hour, 11.42, it's actually gonna be more than that. <clears throat> You're indicating more than an hour, you believe it's off by an hour because it wasn't changed over for right. savings? Right. So that would only be an hour, though, right? That would only be an hour, but it's actually off by more than one hour. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's it's actually off by more than one hour. How much is it off? It's probably closer to an hour and a half. Closer to an hour and a half. You tell the jury how it is that it's off by an hour and a half. Because when the clock changes, you don't change it an hour and a half, do you change it? Yeah. The reason that we can tell is because if you look at line number two, which is when a master key was used at 12.21 a.m., if we move it by an hour, the 911 calls actually didn't come in, and the first one came in at 12.22 a.m. So there's no way for us to be accessing that room before the shot was actually received by 911. Um, if you look, look at the, uh, if we line that up to when officers actually made entry into that room, which was announced over the um, dispatch and recorded by dispatch on their notes, uh, you'll notice that on the dispatch, they actually made entry at about 0050 hours, I believe it's per the CAD notes. So you've, you've learned since this time, based on what the information the hotel owners gave you, that it's actually off by an hour and 24 minutes, right? Yeah, it's, it's off by, yes. So, so it's not a very, it's not an hour and a half, but an hour and 24 is the accurate figure, right? Uh, an hour and 24, an hour and 28. I think I calculated okay. an hour and 28. You were doing some of the, you were one of the case agents on the case. Yes, I assisted the case agent, yes. And as part of your duties, you were familiar with things like the evidence collection and items that were gathered by your department because you were one of the case agents on the case, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. And, and you collected or participated in the collecting of some video clips from various places, right? No, I did not. But you're aware that the video clips were collected? I was aware they were collected by others, yes. Yeah. But as case agent, you were one of the people responsible for overseeing the work of other people in the department to assist you in gathering evidence, right? I think there's a misconception there. I'm, I was assisting the case agent. I'm not a case agent, but I was assisting the case. I was with her hand in hand to assist her in anything she needed. So anything she needed, and I would ask her, what do you need? And I would go out and do it. In this instance, with regards to the videos that you're talking about, that's nothing I was ever, ever tasked with doing, so I didn't do it. So that was someone else's job? Yes, sir. And you're aware from your review of the reports in this case and your participation in this case that in the room 7-Eleven, uh, your department located um, some shoes, right? Yes, we did. A pair of black Puma uh, sneakers, correct? Yes. And you're aware, based on your participation in this case and your review of the information in this case and your supervision of people in this case, that when Tai Chan was arrested, he was barefoot. That's correct. Also aware, based on your work in this case, that I may have a moment, please. Thank you, Detective. You're aware that you, as part of what you were doing, you listened to audio recordings. Right? Yes, sir, I did. And these were audio recordings that uh, were made when a 
recording device was placed near Mr. Chan. You've heard that. That's right. And since you've heard that, you were aware that Mr. Chan said a number of things on that recording. Yes, I am. And you're aware that Mr. Chan said that Mr. Martin was going to kill him. Remember that? I think he made a comment about he shot me first and I had to shoot him, something to that effect. Well, you heard the recording, right? Yes, sir. Would it refresh your memory to review a transcript of that recording? It, it would. Your Honor, may I approach the lady? Yes, go ahead. Your Honor, respectfully, the state of judge, let me on the scope of the direct. Go ahead and present it. If you would just, don't read it out loud, just read it to yourself. Okay. Yes, it does. And also on that recording that you listened to, you heard Mr. Chan say, do you realize I got shot at? Remember that? Yes, I do. And you remember on that recording, Mr. Chan saying, but he shot at me first. He tried to kill me. He tried to kill me. Yeah, I recall that. And after you heard those statements from Mr. Chan indicating that Jeremy Martin shot at him first and was trying to kill me, was trying to kill him, as he said, you began to incorporate an investigation of whether Mr. Chan acted in self-defense in response to the shots by Mr. Martin, right? That was later. That was days later, I believe. After the incident, it was days later. So at that point, given the information that Mr. Chan had said, had stated on that recording, you believe he could have acted in self-defense? No, I don't. <clears throat> he also said they tried to kill me, and as well as he tried to kill me, they tried to kill me. So who the they is or the he is, I, I don't know. So you, wouldn't you be interested in following up on that? We did. We know that there were two individuals in that room. It was just him and Mr. Martin. But you made that decision early on that it was not self-defense? Yes. Kind of a rush to judgment, wasn't it? No. Have a moment, Your Honor? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Chair. months later after the uh, testing was done by the lab. Months later, and even after you learned that information, you still didn't investigate this as a case of self-defense, did you? I did not. What I did was I received that information, that the lab information, and I turned that over to the case agent. That's so what that, I did. So that was someone else's job? Right. Someone else's job? We conferred about it, but, and we decided that it, it didn't appear to be an incident of self-defense. And you were pretty consistent in that, weren't you? Yes, sir. Even after you found out that all the blood on the bed was Mr. Chan's blood? Yes, and that's consistent with the fight or the altercation that took place in that room. <clears throat> and with all the scientific evidence, the DNA on the gun you were aware of, 
became aware later of some DNA of an unknown person. We don't know who that is. So you kind of made up your mind really early, didn't you? We investigated really. I mean, it happened that day. We had to investigate that day. So we had to make a decision as to whether we had probable cause, and we felt we did. You're on a one more moment. about self-defense, there were a lot of others. What were those other comments that were that you recall being on those tapes? Um, him telling the officers to stop on the seventh floor after they detained him. He was telling them, stop, stop. Um, he began, as, after he was taken into custody, saying that there was a bomb on that uh, in, in the hotel. Uh, he couldn't tell where that bomb was. Um, he also told the officer he couldn't tell if it was real or fake, just to investigate it. Um, he stated that they tried to kill him. Um, he made other comments about Santa Fe being in danger. Um, being, I, I'm taking that it's Santa Fe, his department. Um, he was telling the officer to send everybody. Um, and if it, so what if it didn't pan out or words to that effect? Okay. Now. With respect to those others, was there ever a bomb located at the hotel in Conte? No, there was not. Were there any individuals who had firearms, and we'll put aside room 711, of which you're aware? Can you say that again? Okay. Were there any other, did you, were you able to locate any other people who had firearms besides those that were located on where the defendant was arrested and in 7-Eleven? No. Now, defense counsel asked you if you made a rush to judgment. Your response was no. Yes. Would you please explain your response, no? The, the response, no, is, is we didn't rush to judgment. What we did was we did an investigation and we let the investigation lead us wherever it went and where that evidence took us, uh, which consisted of gunshots inside of the room and uh, about five gunshots in the room and then five more gunshots outside of the room. Uh, evidence indicating that shots were f fired in one direction out the door and then fired down the hallway in, in a completely different direction, uh, 90 degrees. Um, there was only one individual uh, that used a weapon that was armed. Mr. Martin was not armed at the time. He was shot in the back. Now, were you able to determine during the course of the investigation whether, whether Jeremy Martin had any firearms with him? He did have firearms with him. Will you please tell the lady and gen ladies and gentlemen of the jury where they were located? Right. In, in the uh, hotel room, there's a small little desk, and on top of that desk was a blue um, duffel bag, just a medium-sized duffel bag. Inside of it was property that belonged to Mr. Martin. And some of that property were two firearms. Um, both of them were in holsters. One was a duty weapon assigned to him from Santa Fe County. It was a Glock that was identical to Mr. Chan's Glock. And there was also a Springfield Armory pistol, a uh, little compact pistol. And both of those were zipped up in that bag in the holsters. Now, where was that bag that you just described in relationship to the door? On to the, the opposite room? side of the room. Opposite side of the room? Yes, sir. No further questions, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burr, Mr. Day. Thank you. Your cross-examination of the place. Detective, you, you, you want to do a really good job at your job, don't you? You consider yourself a, a professional, an experienced, dedicated detective. Right? I try to be, yes. 
And what you just told us was that you had this recording of Mr. Chan, and there was a lot of stuff going on. It was loud, it was noisy, there were things that didn't make any sense that sounded really outrageous. Right, and I okay. indicated that on my right. report. Yes, and you just told us that. Yes. And because of that, what you're telling us is, because a lot of that was just, it just sounded weird and, and you didn't know what to make of it, that you discounted, you put aside what was on that tape because there were so many things that didn't make sense, right? No, sir. In fact, there are some things on that tape on that recording, on that transcript, that may have made sense, right? I thought it made sense. I mean, to me, it, it was pretty obvious what you were saying, except for the parts that were washed out or, or a lot of noise. Like I said, there was some stuff that was not decipherable, but for the most part, right. if you paid attention, you could hear what he was saying. But I was asking you about the statements that Mr. Chan made that said, he shot at me, I acted in self-defense, you fired at me. And what you're telling us is because there was so much other stuff that didn't make sense to you, you didn't investigate that. You didn't follow up on that. You made up your mind based on the no. investigation that you had done and that the other officers had done. No, sir. His statements to me went to his credibility because what he was saying was stuff that was false. Right, but what you thought was because things he said to you were false, that none of it could be true, right? No, I, I, I didn't think that at all. That's part of my consideration. What's, what's true out of what, what's going on here? That's exactly the point, though, isn't it? Right. Right? Yeah. What's true? To... Hey, hold on. Hold on. Mr. Day, please allow. Of course, you're going to complete the response that he's given to you. And again, you have to focus if there's a question being asked. Yes, sir. Wait to hear the whole question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But isn't that the point, Detective Torres, that in that recording, there could have been things that were true, right? There could have been, yes. No more questions, thank you. Thanks. Does the jury have any questions of Detective Torres? May Detective Torres be excused? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, Detective Torres, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. You have no further responsibilities for this trial. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Your next witness.
was the lead attorney for the prosecution. Who is your next witness if there is to be one? Your Honor, the state arrests. With the state arresting its case, it means that at least in this position of the trial, there is not to be any further evidence presented to you by the state. When the state concludes the presentation of its evidence and it rests its case, I have to address some legal related issues with the party, but it must not be done so outside of the presence of the jury. So we're going to have another recess at this point, and we will return to you just as quickly as possible. The evidence is that he was unarmed at that time. He was fleeing a situation where the defendant was armed and a trained SWAT officer who continued to fire as Jeremy Martin was uh, trying to escape. Obviously, this happened in New Mexico, which is you know, part of the um, requirements under the UJI. Uh, the word deliberate, the state, through circumstances and inference, has certainly met. The defendant certainly had the opportunity and the thought before he armed himself with a 357 semi-automatic SIG uh, handgun that was loaded maybe not to capacity, but loaded almost to capacity. This is not a matter where one or two shots were fired. This is a matter where 10 rounds were discharged. All of those rounds, the state submits based on the evidence, were directed at Jeremy Martin. Further, under the instruction, a calculated judgment and decision may be arrived at in a short 
period of time. Once again, the defendant is a trained police officer. The threat had been removed from whatever threat the defendant may have perceived, and we have no, no evidence whatsoever about what the defendant perceived. But if there was a non-lethal threat, that had been well removed at the time that the additional shots were fired. That certainly supports circumstantially and inferentially that there was a calculated judgment and that further a decision to kill was arrived at. It may have been a brief period of time, but the evidence fully supports the fact that the decision was made. This is not based on the evidence before the court in the light most favorable to the state based upon rash impulse. Your Honor, the case law supports that that decision to kill, the deliberate decision to kill, may be arrived at in a very brief period of time. Certainly in less time than I've been addressing to the court on the motion for directed verdict. I will not belabor any further evidence the court has heard at all, but certainly from the state's perspective, there is more than ample evidence for which, from which, the jury can and should decide the guilt of the defendant for first degree murder. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Your Honor, very briefly respond. Briefly, thanks. Your Honor, even in the light most favorable to the state, the state has failed to prove that this was a deliberate and intentional killing. We need to look no farther than their own hypothetical presented to the jury and to the expert witness yesterday that this was a fist fight in that room that developed into the killing. And the state's own hypothetical, by their own words, by Mr. Work's own words, we need to look no further to show that they do not have sufficient evidence to support the first degree charge. Thank you. Again, let me review the jury instruction that applies to the description of the crime that is charged, which is first degree murder, willful and deliberate. Willful and deliberate. Again, here for the defendant, for the jury to be able to find the defendant guilty, and we certainly are not at that stage yet. Nevertheless, this is the jury instruction that has the elements of the crime. The state has to prove to the satisfaction of the jury beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. The defendant killed Jeremy Martin. There certainly is evidence that has been presented that would be supportive of that element. Number two, the killing was with a deliberate intention to take away the life of Jeremy Martin. And number three, this happened in New Mexico on or about the 20th day of October 2014. So the issue is related to deliberate intention. And again, the same jury instruction gives a definition. And again, this is to help educate those that are interested in this matter. A deliberate intention refers to the state of mind of the defendant. A deliberate intention may be inferred from all the facts and the circumstances of the killing. The word deliberate means arrived at or determined upon as a result of careful thought and the weighing of the consideration for and against the proposed cause of action. A calculated judgment and decision may be arrived at in a short period of time. A mere unconsidered and rash impulse, even though it includes an intent to kill, is not a deliberate intention to kill. To constitute a deliberate killing, the slayer must weigh and consider the question of killing and his reasons for and against such a choice. Again, having to look at it in the totality of the evidence that's presented, the court, although certainly there can be different views in terms of whether this jury instruction can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, that really is the province of the jury. Whether or not, what was the state of mind of the defendant, whether there was a deliberate intention, is a factual related issue. 
And that, the court believes, is the province of the jury. The uh, court, having to look at this in the light most favorable to the state, at this stage of the proceedings, is going to deny the motion for a directive. Having arrived at that decision, um, we're going to take, again, a brief break. Uh, let me encourage the parties to review the uh, exhibits to see if they, all of the exhibits that were intended to be introduced have been introduced. And Mr. Uh, Day, we will return and we will begin with the defense's case. And who are you intending to call as your first witness? Detective Arnold Powell's. Okay. Right. So Detective Powell's, please remain available to us. Also, let me encourage the parties with the information that was provided to the court and our discussion here at the bench. Um, we may, it probably would be a good suggestion to have Detective Powell's review whatever report might be available concerning one of the items, um, photographs of which have been already admitted into evidence, and through her testimony, perhaps uh, be able to establish some of the facts that, that were not addressed during the state's case. So let me encourage the parties to look at that as an option as well, as, a, as an alternative to a stipulation. I'm also going to ask for the technology review some very short video clips. The state hasn't bothered any use of evidence, but to establish the times and locations we have those up. We don't intend to offer the evidence, but there's stills that will show our the times. How long of a uh, how long of video is it? Uh, there's video clips and, and there, there's stills video clips, so she can take a look at those. Just to refresh pressure recollection regarding some times. Let's try to take keep our break to about ten minutes. Yeah. If we're able to, and again, let me encourage cooperation related to addressing the issue of the court that has been discussed with the court. I believe that that can be accomplished within the next 10 minutes. That way we have sufficient time. 